Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining our panel. I'd like to begin by thanking the Indian Institute for Human Settlements for including us today in this year's Urban Arc Conference. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. Hi, I'm Ariana Dickey from the University of Melbourne. And here with me today are Michaela Kuto, also from the University of Melbourne, Carla Washbourne from University College London, Mona Fawaz from the Beirut Urban Lab, Shreya Anand from IIHS and the Bangalore Urban Observatory, Susan Parnell from the University of Bristol and the Peak Urban GCRF program, and Alex Frediani from the International Institute for Environment and Development and the No GCRF program. Today we'll be presenting and discussing the work that urban observatories do, institutionalizing urban imagination between trust, advocacy, and expertise, and thinking about how the imagination of a place is institutionalized through observation. We'll begin with an introduction to the anchor report and move from there to hear from our case studies, starting with Mona and her experience with the Beirut Urban Lab, and moving on to Shreya and her experience with the Bangalore Urban Obs Observatory. From there, we'll hear from our discussants, Sue and Alex, and then open up for 20 minutes of Q&A. And finally, we'll close with a reflection from Carla. The Anchor Report, Urban Observatories, a Comparative Review, will be launched next week, along with a COVID-specific working paper and related podcast episode, which you can access at the following URL. Now that we have intros out of the, out of the way, I'll begin the presentation. So let's start first with what are urban observatories? We define urban observatories as boundary spanning institutions, which is to say they are institutions that work between different fields. In this case, research and decision-making. Their role is focused on urban knowledge about one or more urban settlements. They perform an explicit monitoring role on a range of urban issues, and they can be found across the global North and South. Some of the earliest documented references to urban observatories was in the United States in the 1960s in reference to research partnerships between cities and universities designed to make decision making and data collection more scientific. The term revived in the late 90s with UN Habitat's creation of the Global Urban Observatory Program, which involved local and national authorities seeking to develop locally relevant but globally linked urban data on factors such as social development and poverty eradication environmental development and beyond. Currently, there are at least 187 of these institutions recognized by UN Habitat. For our comparative review, we conducted desktop research and semi-structured interviews and analyzed 32 self-identifying and UN designated urban observatories, as well as institutions who may not identify themselves as such, but that we identified as having observatory-like functions, featured here on this map. From this analysis, we located a range of features, activities, and outputs produced by these institutions. Building on UN Habitat's definition, as well as academic and practice literature, we have identified five key functions that urban observatories are expected to perform, some or all of, which you can see on your screen to the left. These functions deal equally with the twin core boundary spanning and monitoring roles that observatories conduct. Further, through our analysis of the strategic visions stated by our case study observatories, we identified four non-exclusive types of visions our observatories seek to achieve, which guide their activities and determine their forms of urban action. These institutions operate across multiple scales from the neighborhood or community level up to the international. The diversity of scales at which these institutions operate allows for an urban conversation that attends to multiple perspectives around today's urban condition. Likewise, their governance structures vary, underscoring the multiple ways urban observatories and their activities have been institutionalized based on their host. Finally, observatories produce many kinds of outputs, ranging from policy papers to research reports to academic publications and beyond. An examination of their outputs revealed the thematic approaches observatories take to monitor and analyze their localities, with environmental sustainability being the most oft addressed themed. How observatories frame their research findings play an important role in constructing and institutionalizing the imaginations of the places they observe. 
When COVID-19 hit, we organized a two-part COVID-specific workshop series to hear from our colleagues at six of the observatories we studied for the comparative report, bolded here on this map about their experiences spanning urban research practice boundaries during this particular moment we find ourselves in. The workshops revealed a number of critical functions observatories played during the crisis. First, they had ready access to pre-existing data and analytical expertise as a result of the monitoring role they regularly play. They mobilized this data and expertise in order to conduct capacity filling and strategic support roles for governments responding to the pandemic. And through their established channels of communication, they were able to quickly disseminate information and outputs relevant to the crisis. Their positioning also enabled them to produce specific responses attuned to the needs of the localities in which they operate. Observatories leveraged pre-existing relationships with communities and prior capacity building activities to support communities in responding to COVID-19. And observatories played an important advocacy role bringing the voices of typically marginalized urban groups to the fore of city level decision making and calling for recognition in the pandemic response of the complex and compounding vulnerabilities these groups face, rather than opting for a one size fits all city response that authorities typically favor. Emergent across these experiences are three key learnings. First is the significance of the established and trust based relationships observatories have both with decision makers and with communities. Second is the important advocacy role observatories play in drawing attention to a more nuanced understanding of the city. And third is the value of the strong continuous data and analytical expertise observatories provide. Michaela will now discuss in greater detail observatories role in institutionalizing urban, observatory, urban imagination. Yeah, thanks, Ariane. And again, thanks a million to Shreya and the IHS team and everyone else for putting together um, Urban Arc virtually this year. And it's it's terrific to have a chance to pitch a bit of this um, finally no longer work in progress to um, to some of you and and be very much looking forward to the feedback. And again, it's sort of an open project for us. So feel free to reach out uh, for more information. Uh, I thought I'd uh, just took very briefly a couple of minutes about, sort of, I guess, where we saw the the theme of the conference or the issue of the urban imagination and imaginaries emerging uh, in the project. And I guess the project, uh, uh, just to top it that way, was uh, and is very much not an effort in cataloging um, observatories. That's something that, that the UN itself does already, uh, but much more in sort of trying to give voice to these experiences and the vast variety of these experiences. Um, and I have to say, we've used observatory as a bit of a portmanteau, sort of a standing word. Uh, in fact, we speak of observatories, as Ariana was saying, and observatory-like functions, uh, just simply to identify those foundering, spanning uh, knowledge institutions. Um, and I guess I, I wanted to start from that because it's very blatant for from the vast majority, if not the near totality of the case studies that we stumbled across, whether in the north and the south, uh, uh, that the dynamics of urban knowledge there quite self-evidently are not neutral uh, and are very active and contested reality. So I guess this fits quite well from our perspective in the idea of uh, these institutions uh, 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 playing and relating to urban imaginaries and creating them. And in a sense, the urban imagination being very much a symbolic sphere uh, in, in the sense of it being a complex field of politics, of knowledge and knowing. Um, and we wanted to put the emphasis on the with the panel on the idea of looking at those observatories, uh, not just as places place, uh, um, for the symbolic sphere, but very much the institutions uh, and the institutionalization of the symbolic sphere of, your, of urban imagination. Uh, and what happens when you look at the institutions themselves? Um, one of the things that stands out to us is that the case of observatory highlights how urban imagination in many cases is pretty much the raison d'etre, the logic of specific institutions and how specific institutions operate uh, and very much the animator of how they do um, certain things or the majority, if not the near totality of the things that they do. Um, we, in the report, speak a bit of the observatory and the space that observatories occupy in urban governance, more, more specifically, uh, as a translation zone. That's a term from translation studies uh, uh, by Emily Apter. And this is simply to say that this is a very much valuable space in our mind where to investigate 
more deeper, but with a sense of the institutions behind it, uh, how different urban knowledges connect, uh, but also how they converge, how they clash, uh, and how the politics of knowing the city, whatever that is, uh, uh, and it, it's blatant that these cases uh, speak to a vast variety of, of that, uh, um, how they play out uh, um, in their places in and around the world. One of the uh, things that I wanted to flag, I guess, sort of just four quick things to flag and to throw a bit to the panel, and uh, we're very much sort of looking forward to hearing from the experiences of Beirut and, um, and, and Bangalore. Um, one of the things that stands out to us is that clearly these institutions, when we start talking about uh, the importance of the institutions behind urban imagination and how the imaginaries are a critical part of urban governance and urban politics in places, but also in between places, um, simply because as Ariana was flagging, some places and some of these institutions are focused on specific places they named of uh, and after, but many other institutions work internationally or, na or locally or um, sort of uh, regionally. And um, one of the things that stands out to us is that they clearly very often play a very particular balancing act in the politics of the urban imagination. They have to balance, and that's sort of where the title of the panel comes from, uh, uh, the idea of sort of fostering trust in the knowledge that they produce uh, um, and the role that they often play in providing expertise about urban issues and urban processes, uh, but also the advocacy that many of them play, for instance, uh, and quite cr critically for inclusion and for social justice purposes. Uh, and that the relationship to decision makers becomes key. Uh, and many of these entities have very tight relationships with decision makers, if not uh, as funders as well and founders of these institutions. Uh, but also they play a critical brokering role. We've seen it with many, many, many cases um, like the Karachi Urban Lab or SLURC uh, in Sierra Leone in the idea of also being brokers for communities to access decision makers. So in a sense, the, one of the key things for us there is that the balancing act of the institutions that work with urban imagination is a very careful and complex one. Uh, and that requires sort of grounded knowledge um, uh, at the very least. Um, but that brings up, and I guess that's the last part from me uh, out of the sort of general report, uh, I guess sort of three complex tensions in the politics of this translation zone, and especially three complex tensions in institutionalizing this translation zone in a boundary spanning role like that of an observatory. Um, first, uh, that observatory is embodied the tension between, I guess the value, but also the pitfalls of international circuits. That the vast majority of these entities and IHS is a perfect example. We've got examples on, on our side of the world. And I guess the reason why we've got um, Sue and Karen is that very much peak and know our examples of international efforts at connecting these type of entities. Um, but on the other hand, sort of these international circuits surface both the tension between localizing and brokering more uh, internationally engaged cosmopolitans, some um, put it uh, uh, experiences and flows of knowledge, uh, but also that by operating in these international spheres, uh, the tensions of the international circuits of knowledge get embedded into the local realities uh, um, of producing and mobilizing, um, and mobilizing urban information, knowledge, data, experiences, and voices. Um, the second for us is very much the tricky consideration as to their institutional relationship uh, of funding, of philanthropy, of investment, uh, uh, of their embeddedness within wider power relations uh, of government that, that, that sit behind these entities uh, and that recent work in, in, in urban um, imaginations very much points to as critical. Um, and I guess the very last, and that's where I wanted to sort of um, end, is that in being sort of institutionalized formats for urban imagination, they embody the fundamental tension between different type of no types of knowledge. Um, as Arena was flagging, they, these type of entities produce all sorts of things in terms of urban research, uh, but certainly in themselves and in their relations with their st stakeholders and their knowledge communities, I guess, um, there's very much to be garnered by what colleagues at the GS GCRO uh, in, in Johannesburg, for instance, called the micropolitics of data, the idea of uh, 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 privileging one or the other mode of knowledge, but also the macro politics of 
local knowledge politics. So I guess in a sense for us observatories, and that's where I'll leave it, uh, um, really brought up uh, the story of how these tensions uh, uh, emerge and how they get institutionalized and how they operate. Um, this was not an effort of sort of a final roundup of this. It's very much at the beginning of a conversation with many of them. So I guess I'll throw it onward, uh, if I'm not wrong and Ariana correct me, to Mona in Beirut first. Uh, but I guess this has been fundamentally for us an, an effort in hearing these stories. So very much looking forward to hear a few more stories. Thanks, Michele. Uh, yes, on, on to you, Mona. So should I start? Good morning, uh, everyone. And thank you, Shriya and the IHSS for inviting me. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to present to you today uh, some of the work that we have been doing at uh, the Beirut Urban Lab at the American University of Beirut. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, talk to you a little bit about um, the work that we do at the lab. Um, so after many, many meetings and discussions, we came up with a sort of a definition that we uh, felt represents us uh, well collectively. Uh, it's one that says that we're collaborative and interdisciplinary research space. And we really emphasize research because we felt from the beginning that at the lab, located in a university, we wanted to uh, put our research in a way that is meaningful at the service of both uh, our context where we live uh, meaningfully, but also at the same time as a conversation with other contexts, very much in, in line with what was just said, so that we can be infusing and informing experiences and ideas that are coming from uh, other contexts and learning from uh, and with other experiences. So our lab is at the intersection between, um, uh, on the one hand, really documenting and attempting to put at the disposal of activists, uh, researchers, colleagues, students, professionals, public sector actors, a documentation and an analysis that can allow for a transforming, uh, uh, or to begin with generating debates and allowing for transforming processes in Lebanon and in the region, particularly in relation to the built environment. Uh, so uh, one of the terms that I would emphasize in this discussion uh, is the ecosystem of change. We felt that we were up, that after years of working uh, together as uh, researchers uh, independently and together as faculty members and researchers in a school of architecture and a graduate program in urban planning, it was time for us and to to put our work together because we felt that the influence, uh, the conversations, the projects that were being initiated that were coming out of this place had to be anchored somewhere that allowed for uh, um, one of the actors to invest in uh, cr creating and strengthening that ecosystem of change. Because in Beirut, um, there has been uh, quite a large number of non-governmental organizations, social movements that have demanded uh, issues related to the city, uh, whether it is more social justice, the right to housing, more public space, public transport. These questions are at the core and better urban governance, of course. These questions have been at the core of what social movements have done here. And so for us, seeing that many of the people who were part of these efforts uh, were our former students, were people who were building indirectly on our research, made us keen to sort of institutionalize, locate and uh, strengthen the networks that existed here, very much inspired by other experiences we had learned uh, uh, from around the world that we felt had uh, already played uh, this role. So one of, uh, first, as I said, we started working quite independently. I think the first time we collaborated together uh, was in, back in 2006, following the Israel war on Lebanon, when many villages and urban cores were completely demolished. So uh, we found ourselves at that point, uh, really uh, working first in parallel and then together, uh, forming a, a group with our students, with colleagues, with NGOs, uh, 
and trying to influence the process of this post-disaster recovery. Uh, eventually, there were publications, there were some successful experiences, other less successful experiences. But we felt that in this context, the value of putting out not only data and information that people trusted because it was produced from an academic context, because it was rigorous, uh, but also questions that help people think through why is it important to think through the post-disaster recovery this way um, was something that all of us felt uh, critical in the way in which we, uh, uh, in which we, sorry, in the meaning of our scholarship or why we were working as scholars from Beirut in Beirut uh, and still trying to uh, publish in international presses and sort of play the academic game that uh, we have to do based at, the, at, at an American institution here. Eventually, more projects came out, some that we did collectively, others we did independently. So just to show you quickly some of those, this is one of the dearest projects to my heart still to date. It was a critical reflection on an analysis of the way in which uh, militar militarized security was proliferating in Beirut and continues to, and how this affected the meaning of the public in the city. And so what we did is we mapped, among other things, every single security component in Beirut, and we sort of then interviewed many people and drew maps that um, demonstrated the diverse effects that these had on different uh, individuals uh, in the city. Um, the map and the booklet with the stories, with the reactions was published uh, as part of a newspaper for uh, that went to, to homes we didn't know. And that triggered really a lot of conversations, reactions, sometimes calls from the security, but allowed us to, to, to really generate a, a conversation and encourage more uh, students, colleagues to stand against it and eventually make it one of the main demands of many social movements to open main streets to resist this. We went on with work on the public space, uh, and that was really very much before uh, setting up a lab, uh, thinking about other forms of controlling and militarizing uh, the city, uh, celebrating social practices uh, and ways in which people had occupied uh, public spaces, um, demonstrating the way in which these spaces were not so public, and also producing not only research for public uh, debate, but also uh, pl projects, actual planning projects uh, that are built on mapping, analyzing, studying that can demonstrate the possibility for public agencies to, for example, in this case, protect the city's coast. So a document like this, just to give you an idea of the network, would be worked with local researchers, many volunteer local planners would participate in conversations and debates and workshops. Uh, to produce the document and then involving public sector actors, particularly in the city's municipality, to sort of try and um, emphasize um, how important it is that they um, uh, that they um, that they uh, that the possibility actually to put in the realm of the possibilities uh, that it is possible to have a public coast and why this would be uh, important for the city. Eventually, all of this was uh, institutionalized in a lab in 2018. And here really, I think uh, the, the points that were just made by Michele about funding, about attracting the interest of international organizations and donors, uh, because there is no way we can get any funding from a Lebanese public sector. There is no funding for research from the state. So being able to attract attention of international funders, uh, and uh, the UN, the Ford Foundation, et cetera, was critical really in being able to establish that lab as a space that can uh, carry itself, have its website, and uh, become a, a place that consolidates a voice. Um, one of the, th so I've already said a lot of the things we do that we produce and disseminate this impactful knowledge. Uh, both in the form of scholarship and critical inquiry, but also documentation, that we do that using design, but that we're also constantly developing uh, our own experimental methods and tools of investigation that are adapted to a local, local context where there's red tape, where there's policing, um, where you have to, to speak multiple languages and really understand, I mean, the, the, the social divisions that exist across Beirut's neighborhood. But also, and I think this is one of the things we, we really cherish very much is training and mentoring uh, 
younger scholars. Who, and, and this is a space that's really growing. We, uh, we struggle with how many we actually can bring, uh, bring on board and try to support because there's so much demand from the youth to be part of, uh, of this project and to, to sort of work as researchers. Um, we also really very much seek to uh, create networks with public agencies, with other non-governmental organizations, uh, with, act with activists to respond as much as possible in the selection of the projects we do and in their formulation to issues that already have champions in the city so that we're working with actors who can influence change um, and um, engage as many publics as uh, possible. Um, so you can see here some of the things that uh, we've been doing uh, with the community. Uh, in the upper picture is a, meet, a community meeting immediately after the Beirut port blast, in which we uh, we sort of brought the residents of one of the poorest neighborhoods and all the NGOs working in the area, trying to uh, discuss with them how uh, the um, the, how the explosion had affected them and working with them through a plan that would be bottom up. That's work that's continuing. We now do it in partnership with the UNDP and other actors so that, uh, uh, and local NGOs, so that there can be a local recovery plan that's championed and supported by residents. Uh, the picture below is, in, is one of the community uh, meet, uh, one of the public debates that was happening during the uprising last October. Uh, and really the, everyone from the lab was on the ground uh, sharing knowledge about connections between finance and housing, uh, what kind of housing demands we can put on the ground, why things were uh, connected, to how, how these could carry a project of change. So we're very much on the ground, but we're also very much trying to uh, at the same time, work in producing knowledge that otherwise doesn't exist about uh, the um, about the city. Um, oh, my ten minutes are up. I'm sorry. Um, so I'll I'll just scroll, scroll through the slides in two minutes since I don't have time enough. Just to show you, this was mapping Syrian uh, refugees working in Beirut as delivery drivers, um, which I think is very relevant in this COVID moment. Uh, because they are frontliners that are not recognized and working really through very much through their trajectories to understand uh, how they reinvent the city and its geography and its divisions. Um, our work in the post-disaster uh, recovery was very much based on a big project we had initiated a couple of years ago, mapping Beirut. There was no plan of Beirut that was accurate, actually. So we've mapped, uh, uh, we've mapped the city. We've developed a very accurate plan that georeferenced. We've made it available to the public. We continue to update it. And this became uh, the way through which, uh, in the post-disaster moment, a lot of, uh, we, we went around just giving that same base map that Georeferenced reference to every single actor, the Red Cross, the military, the NGOs, the municipality. And so as everyone was doing surveys and damage assessments, what was happening is that it was possible for the first time to actually cross the data and produce one data set, one base of knowledge that multiple actors who otherwise don't talk to each other uh, can coordinate. Um, and again, with COVID, trying to create a different conversation uh, in the city, this time really not so much in terms of uh, counting where and how it affects the most vulnerable communities, because that's quite obvious, but also in thinking about how it re-territorializes the country and recreates the division that were already there during the civil war by delegating to multiple actors and political parties uh, the work of instituting isolation spaces, uh, res being first responders, etc. I'm sorry I took more time than I should. I'll stop here uh, and uh, answer questions if there's any. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Mona. We'll move on now to Shreya whenever you're ready. Uh, great, thanks. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, and in the meantime, just take a moment to thank everyone, uh, both, you know, Michele, Ariana, Carla, for, you know, just putting this panel together, for everyone to be here and for everyone who's listening in, thanks uh, for being here. I'm just going to start my uh, slideshow. Okay, I hope that's visible to everyone. So I'll just start with maybe sharing a little bit of context about what the Bangalore Urban Observatory uh, really is or what it actually hopes to be because it isn't something uh, yet. 
so uh, we IHS has been featured in uh, sort of the report that Ariana opened up with uh, as a sort of uh, urban knowledge institution, a boundary spanning institution. But uh, today I'm going to be presenting one specific initiative of the IHS, which is a Bangalore Urban Observatory. Currently, this is being seeded by the two GCRF projects that Nikhele mentioned as well, Peak uh, and No, and Sue is one of the PIs of Peak. She's with us here as well. Uh, and uh, we are hoping, I mean, it's, it's part of a longer conversation that's been ongoing before these projects as well. And we are hoping that it's something that will outlast, uh, uh, you know, the projects as well, but, uh, you know, very much echo Mona's reflections on what this means in terms of the sustainability and longevity uh, of building something that's relying on, uh, you know, external and foreign funding. Um, so it's not something the Bangalore Observatory by itself is not something that exists yet, uh, but it is sort of the bringing together of work, uh, similarly to as Mona was saying, interdisciplinary and collaborative work of several of my colleagues here at IHS that are looking at Bangalore that are focused on Bangalore. Uh, and so I'm hoping to use today's talk to really present a set of uh, ideas and propositions about what the observatory can be and what it can become. And I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, reflections from the rest of the panelists on, on these propositions. Uh, so the first thing uh, we did when we really started uh, thinking of this idea of the, the Bangalore Urban Observatory was really build a historical spatial narrative of the city spanning 150 years, looking at sort of its multiple various intersecting transitions uh, along infrastructure, economy, ecology, and various other other themes. This was a physical exhibition that we ran um, in January last year in Bangalore. It was called Nakshay Kathe. Uh, and it drew on an archive of historic maps that we had assembled from the British Library and from other local sources over the years. Uh, and I'm going to share one snippet, one image from one of these maps, because this is going to be a theme that's going to recur throughout the presentation. Uh, this is a map of Bangalore in 1856. And the pink boundary that you see here is the boundary of the British cantonment uh, as it existed then. Uh, and here, what you see, if you can see my mouse cursor on the west uh, of the city is where the pre-colonial or native town was or the Peta was. Uh, and this west versus east divide is something that's going to you know, be a theme that recurs through the rest of uh, my presentation. Uh, so uh, as we kind of moved on from this moment of you know, building this historical archive, uh, the next thing we confronted was uh, the issue of overcoming data gaps. Uh, and this is something that's a familiar theme again with colleagues uh, in the Global South and you know, the other observatories that have been featured in this report have you know, done a remarkable job of, of bringing these data sets together. And you know, our difficulty was on ensuring that we had data of adequate spatial and temporal resolution uh, that could help us gain a really fine-grained understanding of what was going on uh, in the city across its land markets, across infrastructure, across the economy, across its ecology, and so on. Uh, and over the last two or three years, again, we've uh, invested a lot of effort in uh, creating, uh, you know, tapping into novel or new data sets, into creating new methodologies using satellite data to create a series of maps that actually create a baseline of evidence about what's happening in Bangalore. I'm just very quickly going to go over a few examples here. Uh, this uh, rep uh, represents our own work on employment. Uh, and this was an effort to go from the ward level, uh, which is really a very large uh, spatial unit to say something meaningfully, given the context of deep uh, proximate inequalities that we have in our context. So this was an effort to move from the ward level to the next map, which is at the enumeration block level and allows us to see much more granular detail. Uh, the next series of maps are similarly work by my colleagues, which uh, attempted to map population density, again, going from ward level to this is at the pixel level, uh, which allows us again to see things at a much finer resolution using satellite data. Uh, and the final instance I'm going to share is a map of average housing uh, price across the city of Bangalore, again, done by my colleagues, uh, which is the first time such a data set has been really assembled uh, for the city of Bangalore. Uh, but what I'd like to do today is to really ask about, you know, to probe further into what these sort of flat 2D map representations allow us to see and what they leave out. Uh, and I'm going to open with two propositions, uh, which are thinking across temporal, which are about thinking across temporal scale, which is thinking back in history, uh, which is what I opened with, uh, and how thinking across the spatial scale, how looking at the unit of the neighborhood allows us to unsettle some of these 
city scale assumptions or city scale mapping uh, efforts that I showed you. Uh, and to do this, I'm going to really use the case of some of uh, my recent research along with one of my colleagues uh, on Rajaji Nagar, which is one of Bangalore's uh, oldest planned industrial and residential neighborhoods. Okay, just to give a little bit of a sense of orientation about where Rajaji Nagar is. This is Bangalore, this is the extent of the current city. Uh, but these two uh, dark patches these are in the center, this uh, Western patch, the dark gray patch in the West, uh, is what was governed and administered by the Mysore Maharaja and the Mysore government in the early 1900s. And the Eastern patch is what was settled by the British uh, cantonment. And if you see this inset image, this is, uh, oops, sorry, one second. Uh, this uh, patch is the neighborhood of Rajaji Nagar. And these two darker gray patches are the industrial area, whereas the rest is the residential area. So as you see, this neighborhood sits uh, immediately adjoining what was the historic core um, native settlement uh, of Bangalore. And uh, this is something that really plays out, as I'll explain, uh, in the contemporary mo moment as well. Uh, so what we were studying in Rajaji Nagar was really looking at uh, the transformation that it had uh, undergone since the early 1990s, which is following uh, economic liberalization of India's economy and, uh, you know, following a radical sort of shift in Bangalore's economy as well. Uh, and what we were seeing was uh, in many of these industrial plots along this main road, we saw a conversion into these marriage halls and convention centers, which you can see in the bottom right image. Uh, and what we wanted to understand was get into this neighborhood and understand of course, this was in a way reflective of the larger sort of real estate and industry to services kind of dynamic that was unfolding in the rest of the city. Uh, but in a way, it was also contrary to what was going on in the rest of the city because it wasn't going down the conventional high end real estate uh, redevelopment route that we see elsewhere. And that's what we were really interested in unpacking. Uh, and what we found was uh, that the key to understanding this was to kind of keep rewinding uh, uh, in history. And if you go back 50 or 60 years to when Rajaji Nagar was planned, it sits at a moment in the 1950s and 60s of post-independence India when the national government was really investing heavily in uh, industrialization. It was setting up large-scale industries, uh, many of which were located in Bangalore and many of which are located in this western part of the city. Uh, not only that, uh, they also had, uh, the, the government had also this vision of integrating small scale industry with large scale industry, you know, recognizing the kind of outsourcing, ancillarizing and other kinds of connections. And therefore, Rajaji Nagar was an estate that was planned specifically for small scale industry. And this was a, a big clue to us because it was the small size of these plots and the small size of these sheds, uh, which led to a certain kind of narrative, certain kind of redevelopment that took place here. Um, but what goes even further, if you go another 50 or 60 years back in history, and we come back to what this uh, part of the city was and what this part of the city was, uh, one of the residents of Rajaji Nagar explained this to me, saying that Rajaji Nagar is uh, near the old core area of the city, and it has, has always historically been settled by in, intrastate migrants, so migrants from within the state of Karnataka. It's always been a reasonably homogeneous population, whereas the East has always been settled by people from outside. And therefore, he sees the redevelopment of Rajaji Nagar as catering to a population that's reasonably homogeneous. It was middle class, lower middle class, working class uh, population. And these Kalyanam Mandapas or marriage halls, uh, as they're called locally, uh, were you know, catering to this reasonably homogeneous uh, city population. Whereas the Eastern Belt has, and the Southern Southeastern Belt has been redeveloped uh, into a lot of IT uh, redevelopment, as well as uh, lots of new housing development uh, that caters to migrants from across the country today. Uh, now, of course, the transformations that are going on are, of course, beyond his narrative and his description of that. But how do we use this insight to reinterpret some of the maps that we've been looking at, for example, at the city scale? Uh, so this map, for example, shows uh, large establishments, uh, economic establishments, firms, basically, and the red dots represent manufacturing, whereas the blue dots represent professional services, IT and financial services. And you see that West versus East divide is almost nearly still in place uh, over a sort of 150 year time period. Um, 
now these ideas uh, are quite obvious to a, you know an audience of urban scholars the fact that history matters the fact that uh, you know looking at the neighborhood scale tells us very important things about the city uh, but what i want to use these propositions to do is to really unsettle the idea of what the observatory is what it can do what it can become uh, and uh, one final observation i know i'm out of time i'm uh, you know pretty sorry, sorry about that but i just wanted to uh, leave us with one final observation which is something that we've been grappling with and we're at early stages in trying to resolve this uh, which is about the question of terminology uh, and do we want to use uh, the term observatory which comes with it gives which confers with it this passive observer or expert status uh, and you know mona's work the work that you were presenting on co-production was you know really an inspiration to us because you know we're really uncomfortable with saying that you know we are the experts we will observe and we will create this narrative uh, of the city which comes back to you know michele's uh, provocation on the role of data politics and production and you know what do we really do with this uh, so I'm out of time, so I'll stop here. Really sorry for going over, um, but uh, you know, we're happy to reflect more on these in the Q&A session as well. Thank you, Shreya. That was great. Um, Sue, now we'll, I'll pass on to you. Thank, thank you, colleagues. Um, and it, uh, just to start off by saying it's so exciting to see the range and, and scope of work that is, is going on. Um, I, I've got three reflections um, and I, I think that they connect and I hope so and they, they prompted by the presentations that we've had. Um, the, the first is that I'm really struck by what the difference is between an urban observatory and any other kind of scientific or knowledge observatory. Um, and it speaks to the complexity of the urban question, the city question. So I don't know um, how many of you are familiar with the GTOS and, and GEOS, the Global Earth Observation System and the Global Territorial Observation Systems, which are purely scientific um, mechanisms and, and institutions which have been set up to decide on what should be recorded, on where it should be recorded, with what intensity it should be recorded. And it basically puts into practice a code of what scientists think it's important to measure. You know, how often should you measure nitrogen levels and where should you measure them? And, and basically what happens in that GEOS system and the GTOS systems is that there's, you, you sign up to be part of these, these observatories globally, but you practice locally and you measure what's most important in your region. Um, but the important thing there is that they've decided on what the metrics of those observations are. And clearly those communities of practice are, are much more coherent than we are as urbanists. Um, and although they allow for global diversity, you heard the differences that came out in the ways that we were talking between Beirut uh, and Bangalore. Um, and they are, there's an agreed um, position on what's important, where it's important and what can be compared and critically what the metrics are for that. And what really struck me in the presentations is that we have that, um, but we also have this importance of the political credibility of being grounded in the places that we are um, understanding and of the importance of interpretation of, of, of the art, if you like, um, of the, the practices in, in the observatory. So that's my first thing is to say, I think there's a great deal we can learn because I think they're much better advanced than we are in establishing a global system and network of observatories, which gives power to the local. Um, but clearly we need to have and maintain what makes the urban question um, a unique and difficult thing to study. And that takes me to my second point um, about the observatories. And it, it, it was prompted, Michele, a little bit by, by some of the points that, that you were making and, and also Shreya. I think what's, what's, what's fascinating is what, and, and, and it's implicit in what Manu was saying, is, is that what's implicit, what is interesting about um, observatories is that ideally when they are robust and sustained over time, they have been tracking material and they have information which is durable. It's there and it's in place, it's longitudinal, it, it, it can be used and adapted for other purposes. So the example of COVID is one, but any local rupture, the Beirut explosion would be, an, be another example of that. So the function that observatories um, have is 
it's critical that they have longitudinal data. It is also critical that they have data that is locally embedded and locally, locally credible. But all good observatories, and this is something we, we play with a lot in the PEAK program, all good knowledge systems need to be robust longitudinally, but relevant in the contemporary moment. They need to be relevant locally, and they also need to have global and or, or national comparative values. They have to be able to travel in the way that knowledge is formed. And you spoke about that in relation to funding, but I think that's also in relation to scaling up knowledge. Um, and then the one thing which I don't think came out particularly, and I'd like to highlight, is that I think it's also important that what all observatories have, and, and implicit, it was implicit in what you talked about in, in the interdisciplinary. I'm not sure it's just interdisciplinary. I think that's a, um, a shorthand way of saying we need to know about a number of different kinds of variables. It's useful to know about them in different ways at different scales and possibly even using different methods. And we need in the observatory context to be able to bring those together so that there can be synthesis. And then my final point is that I think what is really interesting um, about all of, of, of what we've been talking about is that clearly observatories will not flourish. And they are such an important and critical element of the science policy interface without deep knowledge, deep investments, and deep expertise. And that scaling up of the sort of knowledge that is embedded in somebody like Mona, holding an organization in fragile places, in fragile contexts, at moments of massive rapid change, is something that we have to see a really significant investment in. And so, Knowledge can't be separated from knowledge institutions. And when we talk about observatories, I think it's really, really crucial that we are able to, to articulate why in some senses this is the vanguard of knowledge production. It's particularly so in the global south when all other systems of knowledge are so much more fragmented. But that frankly is true absolutely everywhere. And it only takes a crisis like the one that we've been in uh, just recently to reveal the imperative of being able to share experiences and to connect uh, and, and track patterns and responses uh, across different places. So I found the papers really uh, provoking, uh, but also um, wonderfully reassuring that there are creative and energetic people um, who are investing in this space. So thanks. Thanks, Sue. Um, on to you now, Alex. Great, thank you for the invitation. Uh, and it was wonderful to read the, the paper and to be part of this panel. It's really exciting and really interesting topic and project. I think we cannot uh, think about uh, challenging imaginaries or thinking about new imaginaries without challenging the existing system through which urban knowledge is legitimated, produced, and disseminated. So at the core of any discussion around imaginations, I think it is the discussion of, of knowledge production. And I think that uh, the panelists, this research is really, is, is really touching on the crucial question of today's uh, discussions of the way that we envision cities and produce cities and, and the urban observatories brings all those questions to the spotlight in a, in a I think a very productive, practical uh, way. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, I, I think I just wanted to also recognize that uh, we are talking from a, a very uneven playing field. The landscape of knowledge production is extremely uneven, as we know. And, uh, and as, as our uh, panelists have been, uh, uh, have been articulating, a lot of the effort is precisely to deal with those inequalities in the processes of knowledge production. We have extremely uneven distribution of resources, uh, and we have very uneven ways through which what knowledge is, uh, is recognized and validated, and also in terms of access to knowledge. So, the role of urban observatories becomes uh, crucial uh, in, in, in challenging inequalities in cities because we cannot challenge inequalities in terms of uh, access to infrastructure services in, in the city without uh, challenging the ways through which knowledge is being governed. And I think uh, uh, this is 
is, is, is really a crucial question. So by doing that, I, I, I was really uh, stimulated by the list of the functions of, uh, um, of urban observatories that was presented in the beginning. It's also in the report from the study. I think it's a really fantastic uh, starting point. But at the same time, uh, uh, the way through which it's been defined is very much from, uh, from let's say, a, a, a kind of status quo uh, perspective in terms of uh, the role of, of those institutions. And I was wondering, uh, and just to be a little bit uh, provocative here, what would mean if we look at those different functions from a more Southern perspective, a decolonial lens, uh, a lens through which we are recognizing uh, different uh, systems of knowledge production, different hubs of, of knowledge productions, and different actors. And what uh, what would uh, would we come up, come out with in, in defining, for example, uh, information gathering and mobilization? So where where would be those sites of information gathering, mobilization? Suddenly, I think uh, would be coming to new new frontiers and new blind spots within which I think many of the uh, activities of uh, of of what is contained within existing definitions of urban observatories is, is often not uh, not engaged with, and I think if we do this exercise, I think we we would really start bringing up a, 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 a very different landscape of knowledge production in the city and recognizing particular hubs as potential urban observatories, uh, neighborhood community groups, uh, networks of civil society groups, uh, uh, social movements that might be uh, producing knowledge for many years about the city, sharing and documenting, and sometimes thinking of institutionalization in, uh, in, in different ways. Yes, one, one way could be around uh, thinking of validating and utilizing this knowledge to influence policy and planning processes in the city, but there might be other sites uh, that is to try to influence other forms of city making, other ways through which uh, uh, the city is being, uh, is being planned and, and produced. And I think this uh, could really open up um, the question of institutionalization uh, towards a very uh, different directions uh, and, and different types of relationship, which I think could be quite quite interesting. I think this relates also to the question of, of that Sue is bringing up, um, then what becomes deep expertise in, in this context? Because we could have deep ex expertise that alienates, that marginalizes, that continues reproducing a system uh, of knowledge production that uh, continues closing the, the doors for particular ways of knowing. Or we have deep expertise that also tries to destabilize that uh, and that tries to ground that uh, in, in different forms of knowledge production and try to recognize those other, other ways of seeing and knowing which are so important to destabilizing the, our imaginations about cities. So I think this is uh, what I just wanted to bring up to, to, to the forefront because in my particular uh, engagement with the Sierra Leone Urban Research Center uh, and the work that I've been doing with the NO program. This is, has been a question that comes down to very simple uh, in really uh, very uh, kind of particular conversations. Uh, when we were thinking about developing a neighborhood plan, for example, of an informal settlement, uh, uh, um, an informal settlement kind of uh, process uh, with civil society, with, with grassroots communities, we often uh, had to come up with that answer that question do we end up going to produce for example a neighborhood plan that uh, talks a language of local government officials but often would be detached from the social processes within which uh, those decisions the processes of making that neighborhood uh, is uh, is being produced and, and so how do we make those decisions and uh, who are the protagonists of those this, this, uh, decisions and we go back to the simple question of what's the audience of some of those activities. And we sometimes have to come up with a decision that is about making jingles to be disseminated through local radio stations uh, instead of the, the kind of complex uh, urban design neighborhood plan that we normally intend to, to try to generate out of participatory or co-produced engagements, we, but which also we saw had uh, also the potential of alienating particular views, particular ways of understanding the territory, or, or even uh, influencing the practices, the collective practices of producing that territory. So, so again, uh, congratulations for, for all the work and, and a very stimulating panel. Uh, and uh, my thoughts here is, is just to, to provoke what would mean to look at urban observatories from a southern lens. Uh, and when we start engaging with that from a kind of decolonial perspective, what would that mean in practice? Uh, but I hope that this is a beginning of an ongoing 
conversation and I'm looking forward for the panel and for the open session as well. Thank you. Thanks, Alex and Sue for your reflections and to Mona, Shreya and Michaela for your presentations. Um, we'll open up now for the Q&A portion of today's panel. So if you wanna put your questions into the chat, we can, I'll read them out and answer as they come in. Okay, for our first question, we have, thank you for those wonderful presentations. As the speakers hinted at, the politics of terminology during the session, there is a connotation of experimentation associated with the idea of the laboratory and that of a neutral observer with that of an observatory. I was wondering if these ideas impact the framing of the aims and objectives of the projects in any way, alongside the particular context of the projects. And if yes, how have the researchers negotiated and responded to these ideas methodologically in their research? I mean, I can answer since we're a lab if you want. Uh, I mean, of course, we thought a lot about whether we wanted to be an observatory or a research center or a laboratory and which one would we uh, uh, choose as a description. But I think uh, for us, it, it was emphasizing uh, both the, uh, the dynamic nature of knowledge production, the fact that it's uh, experimental tentative and yet still, uh, dare I say, rooted in science. Uh, that pushed us uh, towards this idea of the laboratory. Uh, there's undeniably in uh, trying to influence public policy uh, in a context like ours, the necessity to posi position yourself uh, on the one hand as uh, a credible source, as something that's science-based, so you're heard by uh, public sector uh, actors. And at the same time that you uh, you keep that openness, that experimental tone that allows you to be interacting with activists with, I mean, most of us are actually ourselves also have a foot in something else. Uh, and so I think that, that was a deliberate choice for us, but maybe Michele can talk or, um, um, or Ariana, you guys can talk about a larger, uh, um, uh, a larger context than ours. Can I come in quickly on just on that thing about the terminology? Um, I mean, at one level, terminology never matters. Um, you know, in, in a sense, does it matter if it's called a lab or an observatory or uh, and anything else? And, and there's been this very fruitful global discussion about labs. And for me, what's important is what those things do and what they come to mean in um, as, as we kind of ad advance our knowledge. And so for me, what's really important about the notion of the lab is what's happened in so many places in the Cape Town cases and in, in the German cases and the Beirut case is it's that it's really pushed the frontier of this idea of learning from practice and learning with practice and co-production. Um, and, and the politics of that has been absolutely fundamental. What, what I quite like about the idea of an observatory is in a sense that it absorbs the notion of labs. Labs, for me, almost live within the idea of an observatory. It's a much, in other words, observatories are bigger. Um, the whole point, if you think about the kind of astron astronomical observatory, which is really in some ways where that kind of comes from, is, is, is about things we don't know about, but things that we have to be extremely well organized and need new scientific methods to discover. Um, but the, the way is, that's why I started with the point about the global urban observ the, the global observatory, so GEOS and the GTOS ones, is I think that as a community, I would provoke that as a community of urbanists, we would do well to piggyback on the work that those organizations have already undertaken to establish the idea that there should be a system of knowledge collection, production and use which highlights different kinds of measurements, in our case, quantitative and qualitative, at different scales, with some very locally specific. So for example, you know, you don't measure the same plants in Australia as you do in Norway, you know, 
um, but they do measure plants and they do all measure nitrate levels in the soil. And we should be doing the same thing in the urban space. And that for me is what is an observatory. It hinges on the idea that there are multiple labs and particularly, and this speaks to Alex's point, particularly constructed, locally constructed labs that work in places with concepts uh, that are and, and practices that are relevant in, in the global south. Um, so we had a quick question to your response. Uh, can we have the full form of GEOs and GITOs, please? I, it's GTOS, Global Earth Observation System. That's the one. And then there's another one called GTOS, which is Global Territorial Earth Observation. And there may be one now for the oceans, you know, where there's been such a big UN push on the oceans. I just am out of touch. Um, and if the place to where you'll find some information for on those is on the International Science Council. Um, and I'm sure if we send it off back to uh, Ariana and, and Michele, they can make it out there. I'll look while everybody else is and put it up in the chat. So we have another question. Wonderful presentations and thought-provoking insights and comments. What funding sources are available for setting up such observatories, which are extremely necessary, especially in the Global South? Um, Shreya or Mona, do you want to take that? I'm happy to kick us off on this one. We've thought a lot about this. Uh, and maybe Michele and Ariana can uh, reflect on the wider context. I can reflect on the Indian context from our perspective. Uh, so I think this is an incre incredibly challenging question. I think if you are kind of imagining uh, an observatory or some kind of a, a data portal in a sense, in a narrow sense, uh, around depending on your theme of interest, you might be able to find some kinds of support. But in the kind of really open way that Michele and Ariana have put out for us, you know, as a sort of boundary spanning urban knowledge institution, that is radically challenging the status quo. Uh, it is not easy to turn to domestic sources. Uh, and, and, you know, as Alex said as well, we are working in environments that are resource constrained uh, and where uh, there aren't sort of the equivalent of national uh, boards that fund research, that fund uh, the kind of work that we're doing. Uh, and, and so we've, you know, necessarily had to turn to sort of international uh, funders and donors. Uh, but that is also, you know, leads to its own set of challenges. So we're very fortunate currently to be a part of the PEAK project, um, which, you know, unlike a lot of the other global projects, is not set up around, you know, it's a global project, but it's not set up around a set of questions that are examined in a comparative way across the different context of the Global South, but rather it's structured around a set of questions that emerge from the geographies that the peak project is present in, right? And I think we're fortunate to have be a part of a project like that. Um, but, you know, these projects run out, right? They, they run out in three years, they run out in four years, they run out in five years. And there is a big question on the sustainability uh, of something like this, uh, you know, over a long period of time. And, you know, I'd love to also hear Mona's reflections on this, because I guess they've been doing this for a lot longer than we have. Uh, and so how does one really build something which responds to local needs, uh, is globally relevant, uh, and stays attractive to sort of funding ecosystems. Um, and further in the Indian context, actually, uh, you, you know, even spaces for uh, seeking and securing international funding are shrinking as well. So, so it is an inc incredibly challenging space and I'm not sure I have any <laughs> easy answers for it. Um I mean, I completely agree with you, Shreya. What I <clears throat> would add is that uh, maybe over the years, we've learned to be tactical. When, when you want to set something up like an observatory, sometimes you know you're going to get a one-shot big funding, but on the long run, to be able to maintain uh, monitoring of some indicators, you want to have local stakeholders who have a very strong interest in these, uh, in these indicators. And at the same time, that it's not too costly for them to support this. So just to give you one example, the Beirut building uh, built environment database that I, that I shared is a survey of everything that was built in Beirut since the end of the civil war. So we had to produce a base map for Beirut that doesn't exist. It's crazy, right? We had to work with the land registry with the, uh, because you have to define the boundaries of lots. And these are like by negotiation, case by case in many uh, instances. So for us to be able to do that, we got a big grant uh, to produce it. 
And then we deliberately solicited a couple of local institutions, public institutions, that uh, we brought in as partners simply because they would actually put their name on the project. They didn't contribute in the funding, but we knew that it would be very easy for them to continue to give us the data if we wanted to do it. So sometimes really conceiving the project as very heavy on, fun on funding in the beginning and getting this one-time shot and then having the rest becomes almost on, auto, um, on autopilot uh, makes a lot of sense. And I think we learned this over time, like being tactical, understanding that when you get all this big money, um, but certainly uh, for Lebanon, at least in many of the countries in the region, because we're a lot in conversation with Egypt, with Jordan, you definitely need something other than local funding if you want to start something ambitious. I wonder if I could come in also in this question uh, here, just uh, to say that I think that I agree with uh, both the inputs uh, so far on this question, but at the same time, I think we, we also have very different uh, contexts of funding and, and the institutional context of different localities that might uh, create opportunities and also challenges. So in the case of uh, Brazil, we have uh, a public university systems that uh, are, have been able to, to actually with no money uh, to create relationships uh, between academics and grassroots communities to facilitate uh, uh, activities on the ground and collect uh, collect knowledge, collect uh, information that have been useful for for sharing experiences and to influence policy making. And so I think that 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 kind of constellation of utilizing existing uh, uh, institutional arrangements, setting up of research groups in ways that you you involve different stakeholders in the formation of those those research groups uh, have been very useful there. In the case of Sierra Leone, we we had to make it into a project. The Sierra Leone Urban Research Center had to become a project with key performance indicators. We needed to demonstrate uh, that uh, the, the center in itself has brought, would bring about some, uh, some benefits for improving the well-being of, of those uh, in urban, living in conditions of urban poverty. And then uh, tapping into international development agencies that in that context uh, has you know, was a, was a, a, an opportunity in Brazil that is not in the Sierra Leone. I think there has been a, uh, possibilities to to get funding from DFID, from uh, Comic uh, Relief, from different uh, uh, development agencies. But that required us to to think of the center from a project perspective with indicators, and that has been really difficult because it, it, when you you build a, a pipe or you build a house, you can see the benefits directly. It's going to come to people, but to track to have evidence that uh, a knowledge center will generate benefits to reducing poverty is not an easy task. And the more you go through that exercise, also more uh, you, you insert yourself into a knowledge process that is actually that's difficult to keep you open and grounded uh, to localities uh, in the ways that you think it's more emancipatory. So that is a, a trade-off that we, we had to be playing all the time in that experience. Thanks, Alex. Um, we have another question. How, how do you make locally generated knowledge for decision making and governance relative in an international context? Maybe I can throw that one back to you, Alex. Sorry, um, could you repeat the question again? Yes, yeah, sure. How do you make locally generated knowledge for decision making and governance relevant in an international context? Wow. Um, uh, yeah, I think it, it depends on, again, what is the international context that we are talking about here as well. Uh, if we're talking about uh, uh, an international context that is uh, in, the, in the theorization and the discussions about, uh, about cities uh, and the way I understand, I think we have an opportunity here with a, a whole new body of theorizations that uh, is precisely encouraging us to think about those local ways of understanding scenes, generating new lexicons of urban and, and, and city making, that I think it's, it's extremely encouraging at this current time in, in that we are living. So I think uh, if we're thinking about that international context of, of understanding, I think, it's, I think that goes hands in hands, uh, really. But in, in terms of the, uh, into, into, into the spaces of influencing multilateral governance, I think that is a very complicated condition that we are at the moment. Uh, we are actually seeing much more challenges to, 
to, to infiltrate and to engage with those multilateral governance systems uh, if we don't have those robust evidence-based policymaking processes. So what we are seeing is grassroots groups having to play this game. So the Know Your City kind of campaign that SDI has been doing internationally is precisely to generate that kind of uh, knowledge validation that allows them to play a role in international policymaking. And that is requires an extremely coordinated, sophisticated and expensive forms of uh, transnational civil society engagement, which uh, again requires funding and, uh, and resources. So it's a really complicated uh, uh, and, and also again, uh, allows particular organizations and networks that well funded to flourish and others not to, to be able to perform the same type of impact. And may I just add very briefly on that? And I think that the, the most important thing you can do to be globally relevant is to do outstanding work locally. Um, that, that absolutely is the first thing to say. Um, I mean, I think that then the second thing to say is, is that for all of the negative attributes of some of these large projects like Peak or No, and there are some downsides to them, they do provide fairly comfortable networks of getting to know other people doing similar work in other places. So if you can be part of those, it's generally worth your while. Um, and I think what you will find is that you begin to get a global community. Um, and then the third thing is to realize that for most people who are working in smaller, more difficult, less affluent um, cities, actually the world needs to know more about your place than you need to know about the world. So you don't have to worry about actually being incorporated. In fact, be careful what you wish for because you might be incorporated too much and too quickly. Um, but there, there certainly are um, those kinds of avenues and there generally are lots of opportunities. So, you know, even just starting by participating in this sort of thing and learning that there really are people who work on similar things elsewhere and you will be brought into this kind of global community of practice. Thanks, Sue. Mona or Shreya, did you have any reflections on that? I'm good for now, actually. Yeah. Yeah, same. I I, I really agree that uh, that that it does it does start from the local contact. For for me, uh, though, being able to 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 be part of. Uh, networks of colleagues working elsewhere was incredibly important for uh, seeing other possibilities, expanding and challenging the imaginary of what can be and how it happens and provide examples in our conversations and uh, explore pathways. So I would definitely say, uh, don't just stay tucked in, but certainly invest most of the energy uh, locally was for us really um, very working. Thank you. We've got another question that I think Sue might be typing an answer to, but I'll also throw it out to the other panelists. How do urban observatories fit into the current landscape of data production, which is being increasingly dominated by private and enclosed data generation data analysis initiatives, often for profit? How will they deal with such challenges as competition to enclosed data and copyright the same and in 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 intensifies? I'm not sure what that last word is, sorry. Ah, uh, to enclose the data and copyright the same intensifies. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start as well from that one. It's again, something we've been thinking about a lot uh, and uh, is a trend that has definitely been very prevalent in the Indian context. Uh, but this is in the context of a, a state retreat from its public role as you know, collecting that data and putting out that data and making it available to, uh, to researchers that some of these sort of private uh, enterprises uh, that do this data collection have emerged. Uh, and in a way, I feel like, you know, it is, I mean, of course, for us, like I was hinting at in my presentation as well, we are in a space of privilege, right, uh, occupying the space of being able to do this work. Uh, and what that comes with is that we might be able to access, uh, you know, several of these data sets and uh, not in their entire form, but the insights arising from these make these available in other communities that might not be able to directly access them. And I think at least in our case, there's, you know, a very clear commitment towards 
uh, you know, open source, at least for the data that we generate ourselves. And as far as possible, the insights that we generate from other private data sources to be made available to as wide an audience as possible. Uh, so I think we have to, you know, be very strategic uh, and recognize our own roles and our own positions in uh, kind of countering this sort of big data, data privacy uh, movement that's, you know, really taking over all around us. Uh, I'll just add that uh, I think we, we have two trends at the same time. We do have in many contexts, I mean, in Lebanon, we never had a state that collected data. So it's not like we're, we're losing it. We never had it. But as much as it's true that there's a privatization of data, uh, there's also another counter movement with all the open data, uh, uh, the, the young techies who are um, able to uh, sort of circumvent and uh, make accessible very large data sets through their uh, through their uh, sort of their technical knowledge, I'm I'm actually very jealous and really trying hard to uh, to to engage with uh, with uh, with with uh, with this younger younger generation that has really produced a lot of very interesting information and really is completely committed to making it uh, open source, available, accessible. So not only do, do we try to do that as much as possible, but I think we have fantastic partners. And they're like, we saw them in the post-disaster recovery, even appealing in Beirut to, uh, uh, to private companies abroad and saying, look, you have to help us with this one. Uh, let us make this data accessible. And for the first time, perhaps in the history of uh, modern Lebanon, we actually had an outpour of data that, that was available thanks to that. So I think engaging new technologies, uh, uh, trying to, to build on that hybrid knowledge can be a fantastic opportunity to actually change, uh, change the tides. And I think for many of the cities where data collection has been so difficult in the traditional sense of, uh, um, of the word, actually we have new opportunities now with big data to get uh, information that would have been impossible to, to, to get uh, earlier. Um, I, I want to say that here you really have to also think about governance. Uh, in, 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 in our context in Lebanon, for example, getting permits to fly a drone, to do something like this is ex almost impossible. So, uh, so having uh, militarized security, uh, red taping uh, uh, increasing, I think is also uh, something to consider as we think about context and what we can learn and, and what it took. I, I tried for a whole year to get a permit because we, we had support from a private company that wanted to help us get building heights in Beirut. And after a whole year, I just hired two undergraduate students who went building by building for a month and a half and finished the work. And that was it. And I was like, why did I suffer? So sometimes you also want to accept the limitations of the context where you are. Uh, sorry, sorry to just jump in. I have received a time check uh, from uh, the team here. Uh, we have just a few more minutes to wrap up. And I know that uh, Carla was uh, also meant to sort of just come in and reflect. So we should maybe keep a few minutes for that as well. Yeah, thanks, Shreya. Great idea. Um, so, Carla, now we'll pass on to you to close us off today. No worries. Thank you very much. And thank you for the time check. I'll try to be uh, as brief as possible. There's so much to say in reflection, though. Um, the, the points of uh, feedback and reflection that I've taken from the conversation today uh, is that we started with this seemingly simple questions around urban observatories from Michele and from Ariana, what they are, what they look like, what sorts of things they do and produce. But quite quickly, we find ourselves in this much more nuanced conversation, dealing with these underlying tensions between different kinds of knowledge and the relationship of institutions and their operations within these wider relations uh, of power and influence. In this sense, our excellent panelists and discussants have presented these institutions as spaces for seeing uh, enabling and working within ecosystems of change, taking a temporal and spatial lens on current urban challenges and really allowing us to understand the present, but also look to a range of possible futures for these spaces and drawing on very deep knowledge and expertise to do so. There's a range of familiar uh, orientations perhaps presented, which speak particularly to the tone of imaginaries. So things like using design and creating artifacts, which can be seen, heard, handled, shared and discussed. Uh, developing experimental methods and tools and asking questions, including continually addressing ourselves with these very particular and reflexive questions of what do we really want to do, uh, who is involved, who could and should be, who's the audience and what are we really ma making at the end of the day. Uh, 
it's good to recognize there's still much to learn from others working across scales whilst remaining locally relevant and understanding and clearly articulating points of shared interest and value. Integrating and synthesizing, recognizing the potential and the possibility for drawing on uh, a range of different insights from many different sites of knowledge and questioning might our expectations of institutions themselves be even more fruitfully subjected uh, to the lens of imagination. So a key element shared across the conversation today has really been giving a voice, I think, to a range of experiences. And it's something that we really hope to continue to do through uh, this work and continuing discussion. I'll hand back to Ariana uh, for the last few moments. So that brings us to the end of our panel today. I want to thank everybody again for coming to attend this and um, also want to thank our presenters, Mona, Shreya and Michaela and our discussants, Sue and Alex um, and also IIHS for including us today in Urban Arc. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone.